Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. It's a generational thing, creating an understanding of MS between parents and their children, part two. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nikki, and I will be the operator for the presentation today. Before we get started, I would like to take a moment to share with you a few features of the webinar platform. For this webinar, attendees will be in listen-only mode. At any time, you may adjust your audio using any computer volume settings that you may have. If you need technical assistance, please submit your request under the Tech Support tab in the window on the right-hand side of your computer screen. If you wish to submit a question during the presentation, please use the Q&A window on the right-hand side of your computer screen. Once you type your question, please be sure to press Enter to submit your question. We'll try to answer these questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar, but if an in-depth answer is needed or we run out of time, we'll try to answer it at a later time via email. We do capture all questions. We are joined today by our moderator, Alexis Crispino from Multiple Sclerosis Association of America, and our speakers, Dr. Lana Harder and Katherine Chapman. At this time, I would like to turn the microphone over to our moderator, Alexis, for opening remarks. Thank you so much, and hello and welcome again. My name is Alexis Crispino. I'm the Director of Education and Healthcare Relations for the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America South Central Region and your host for this afternoon's program. On behalf of MSAA, our partners at Impact Education, our speakers today and sponsors, we greatly appreciate the opportunity to connect with all of you. And please know we hope you and your family are staying safe and healthy. As you may know, MSAA is a national nonprofit organization dedicated to improving lives today for individuals living with MS in their care community nationwide. Some of our free services include a national helpline, equipment cooling products, MRI funding, an online community, and robust publication library. You can visit our website at mymsaa.org to try out our new COVID-19 and MS Pathfinder tool, which provides ongoing updates and resources on the coronavirus, check out the most recent MSI educational programs, and much, much more. Now, the reason we're here together today, It's a Generational Thing Part 2 is featuring expert speakers Dr. Alana Harder and Katherine Chapman, licensed clinical social worker. Topics for today's event include identifying ways to improve family communication for the patient, care partners, and family members, accommodation plans for school, including a 504 plan or an IEP, and establishing personal and family goals for self-management during the transitional years. At the conclusion of the presentation, we have time for a question and answer session, so please be sure to submit any questions that come to mind throughout the program in the chat box. Also, as a friendly note, the MSAA Pro Educational Program Survey will be available as a link at the end of the program. Completion of these surveys are integral to ensuring the efficacy and quality of our educational programs, and so we thank you for taking the time to complete this. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Jen and Tag Novartis for making this webinar possible. So without further ado, I'm honored and delighted to introduce our esteemed speakers for this afternoon, Dr. Lana Harder and Katherine Chapman, licensed clinical social worker. Dr. Harder leads the neuropsychology service and neuropsychology training program at the Children's Hospital in Dallas, Texas. She holds dual faculty appointments as associate professor of psychiatry and neurology and neurotherapeutics at UT Southwestern. She's board certified in clinical neuropsychology and is a board certified subspecialist in pediatric neuropsychology. Dr. Harder was a founding member and is the current co-director of the Children's Pediatric Demyelinating Disease Clinic, and her research interests include physiosocial outcomes for pediatric multiple sclerosis, transverse myelitis, acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and neuromyelitis optica. Katherine Chapman, licensed clinical social worker, received her bachelor's degree in sociology and master's of social work at Louisiana State University. She received her board certification in 1998 and is a licensed clinical social worker. Katherine works with dynamic multidisciplinary teams participating in research and patient care at Children's Health Dallas, as well as with the Multiple Sclerosis Program at UT Southwestern, where Katherine has been since September of 2002. She assists children and their families by locating resources and providing support information. She serves as a therapist in the adult clinic, assisting people with MS to manage depression, anxiety, insomnia, and general life stressors. We are so pleased to have you join us for this conversation. And again, as a friendly reminder, please include any questions you have throughout the program in the chat box. And I'm honored to introduce Catherine to get our conversation started. Catherine? 
Okay, thank you so much, Alexis. Um, thanks for having me back. Thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to start us off. We um, are going to talk about the keys to communication. You know, we know that MS can disrupt the family rhythm and that all the family members share the impact. And there's so many additional stressors that come along with MS, like the unpredictability of it, the expense of it, those invisible symptoms, lots of decisions to be made. Um, so open and effective communication is just so key to healthy relationships and families. And we are going to start off, though, with a fun question, which is, if you could only eat one dessert for the rest of your life, what would it be? And our answer is here. You can have your favorite flavor of ice cream, chocolate cake, your favorite pie, or cheesecake. I'll see what, I'll be interested to see what people pick. I think it's going to be hard to decide between all those. We've got ice cream and pie so far. It's pie season, right? So. <laughs> oh, we got yes, it is. Now. Yeah, it looks like ice cream's the winner, though. I wonder what Ice cream's maybe. winning? Okay, well, that's yeah, my maybe, topic. Maybe <laughs> <chocolate chip. laughs> yes, okay. So, um, all right, so let's go on to communication. So for family members and care partners of those diagnosed with MS, there is an immediate impact on everyone. And positive communication to keep relationships healthy is essential. And if you're a parent who has MS or a child with MS, there are ways to stay positive. So I, I just want to throw out there, though, that you know, whatever you're feeling, though, is okay. All feelings are okay. You have a right to feel whatever you feel. And just welcome them in. It's okay to be mad. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be angry. Um, you know, all feelings are welcome, but just we don't want to sit in some of those long term. So communicating with your family, they can help you monitor those emotional symptoms, physical symptoms. They can help you to keep appointments and also help with medication regimens. You know, and it can be challenging um, just figuring out what information to share. So typically, the person who has MS, they're getting all the updates and information from their healthcare team. So it's really up to them to, to relay that. And that can be challenging. You know, what are you going to share? Um, but just know that children adapt well. They um, are going to be okay, you know, and actually having a parent with, a, with an illness is going to help them build empathy, help them build compassion, self-sufficiency. It raises their confidence. And just again, just remember that family members react in their own time and in their own way. And so we're going to go over some reminders about open communication. So this is, you know, again, so key. And this is the time just to really flex and strengthen your athletic listening muscle. So that athletic listening is really having the intention to understand the other person. It fosters love. It can create productive dialogue when you're really trying to use that skill. And, you know, try to understand and not make assumptions. And you could ask questions um, like, is there more you want to say about that? Or could you tell me more? Or how do you feel about that? Um, and this one I love, how can I best support you right now? And unity is important um, for parents. They may want to talk beforehand, before they're having a serious conversation with kids or other family members just to be sure you know, that they are on the same page um, of what's being discussed. And do your best to try to not take things personally. And I know this um, is something you know, everybody has to practice, but being defensive just is basically going to shut down any effective communication that's going to happen. And I just want to mention this book called The Four Agreements, because two of the agreements are to not make assumptions and to not take things personally. It's by Don Miguel Ruiz. 
And I think it just might be a great thing for your family to read and just make you feel lighter, um, especially about those two agreements. And if you are getting frustrated, take some deep breaths. You might even want to put your hands on your belly, count your breaths, and just really feel your stomach expanding on the inhale and then you know, releasing out on the exhale. And focus on getting air into your diaphragm. That diaphragm, that's just a really easy way that you can elicit the relaxation response. Um, or you may need to take a time out. Um, but you can practice self-soothing and count your breaths. And give everyone a turn to be the speaker and listener. So you could validate the speaker even by saying something like, oh, you know, that, that makes so much sense to me that you would feel that way about whatever it is, your, the MS diagnosis or trying to figure out a treatment option. You might even want to write down what you want to say, but you just have clarity and make sure you get your, your points across. So um, let's go through these tips on our side. Um, positive communication tips, you know, of course, giving your full attention, which means no screens. Get rid of, turn the TV off, get rid of the phones. Um, you know, and give eye contact to each other and show that you are listening. You know, you can nod your head or um, you can just make little gestures that they know you're listening. Use eye messages. Again, this is so important. You know, like, I feel so tired, you know, when I'm come home and, and doing the dishes, you know, and then make a request. Could you, could you um, help me out with that? Be honest. Um, again, there's no right or wrong feelings. You know, just whatever you feel is okay. And you're just expressing that to the other person. Be aware of the time and place. You wouldn't want to be like in a super busy restaurant having a serious conversation when you can't really hear each other. And then, of course, listening. We talked about listen with an open mind, an open heart, and try to mirror back to that person what you think you heard. Um, so that you can reinforce it. Yes, you are do understand what they're saying. And then we have just some examples here of um, things not to do. Obviously, you don't want to turn away from the person. That doesn't make somebody feel heard. Um, try not to interrupt. This you know can take practice. I know for some, um, but just practice it. You know that let the other person have their time to talk, and then you have your time to talk. Um, avoid blaming or judging. And I um, just recommend try to take this attitude of we against MS. You know, we are in this together. You know, MS is the bad guy. We are together. And then um, really try to not use silence to express your displeasure. <laughs> I think a lot of us use that. Um, this is a passive aggressive form of communication, but it really doesn't help. It's not effective and likely will just amplify the problem. So again, take deep breaths, take a time out and agree to meet later and um, give yourself some space. Okay, so talking with your kids. Um, for family, oh, yes. Um, we have um, a teen's response when asking about her mother's MS diagnosis. You know, it was difficult for us when we found out that mom had MS. She just said, I may have MS. Then a thousand questions came up and she answered, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, because she didn't know either. It was all new to her. And um, this team's just saying, I would have preferred someone in the staff to explain what MS means. So, you know, it is it's so important to be honest and open with your children and family about your MS. And there are reports that show that the more information kids have about MS, the higher their emotional well being. Um, and it also ensures that when you're talking with them that you are the source of their information or the healthcare providers and it provides them reassurance and some sense of control um, when they are able to ask questions to the parents. So maybe for this teen, um, 
having the parents maybe have I, you know, I don't know if they met together first before they talked to this team, but maybe they could you know, meet together to collect information you know, on what they are going to say to the, to the teens or kids and ask the team. They could write down questions that she can um, bring to the doctor and you know, also steer them to reputable information, which would be like through the MSAA. You know, there's just a sea of information um, that's going on um, out there, you know, that kids can get a hold of. So we just want to make sure that they're getting good information. Um, but for sure, what kids need to know is that there is nothing that they did or didn't do to cause the parent to get MS. Nothing they thought or said caused it. The, the way they behave can't change the fact that someone has MS. And that, of course, MS not, is not contagious. They can't catch it or give it to somebody else. And that there's not a cure for MS yet, but there are definitely so many great treatments um, and even more on the horizon um, to manage MS. And it's really good for kids and caregivers to keep up with school and their outside activities. And so here's some more helpful tips. Um, let's see. Let me move slide. Okay, so talking to your doctor about your diagnosis, again, asking questions so you feel informed because knowledge is power and, you know, again, gives people some sense of control. Um, sharing the information with your family. Uh, letting your kids know about the symptoms you're experiencing. So MS has those tricky, you know, invisible symptoms that a lot of kids and even adults don't understand, like the profound fatigue that people have, um, cognitive problems, depression, um, pain. You know, all these symptoms aren't necessarily seen, so that can be more difficult for kids. So definitely, you know, let them know how you're feeling. Um, encourage them to ask questions because this builds trust and allows them to voice any fears or concerns they have because you know they can have definitely have magical thinking and you know think of these worst case scenarios and have all these fears that that you um, probably can reassure them um, that that's not the case and if you don't have the answers talk to your doctor and your healthcare team or look on the MSAA website and then again, just to really um, in, uh, let your kids know that MS is in, in no means is their fault, because again, they can have that magical thinking and, and you know personalized thing and think think things around them are their fault. Okay, so some positive comments for your kids. We have some examples here. Thank you for asking me. I'm glad we can learn together. Um, you know, asking your kid, how can I do better next time? Um, you know, this, all this takes practice. I am proud of you. I appreciate that you came to me when you didn't understand. And just letting them know that you support them and that you are going to be there for them anytime. And, you know, that encourages them to come back with future questions. Um, just letting them know you're there for them and you want them to ask. Um, and be involved. Okay, so for kids and teens with MS, again, same things. We want to encourage open and honest communication. Um, that is so important. Um, you want them to let you know when they're not feeling well. And then when you're talking with kid, your kids about MS, try to stay calm so that they can stay calm too and just make them feel reassured. And then especially as they're getting older, encourage your kids to take more control during medical appointments and with their treatment. And don't delay in discussing. Um, kids, you have this uh, sense, they know when something is wrong and they may be thinking up something way worse um, than what's actually happening. Um, it can just run wild, their imagination. And then again, there's such a 
such accessibility to the web, you know, reading all kinds of things um, that may or may not be true or accurate information. Okay. So at Children's, we um, have a transition program for our, our children's clinic, and this is loosely, you know, the goals that we try to do. We, um, Dr. Harder, Dr. Greenberg, and our nurses, we came up with a transition assessment to give to our kids annually to help make sure that they are, um, that we're touching on all these points through the years so that they'll be all set and ready by the time they leave us. And this um, is basically what we follow. So 15 to 16, this is when parents and us can have the teen practice explaining their medical condition to us, their medical history, having the, your teen practice describing signs and symptoms and what to do when they feel a certain way and who to call, like determining what's urgent, what's not, um, helping your teen learn the names of all their medications and the doses, when they are supposed to take them and why they're taking them. You know, we want them to know that because, you know, we all are responsible for this transition, the healthcare team, parents, um, and of course, the teens, um, you know, we all play a role here. And at Children's, we found that it's best to give little bite-sized pieces each visit um, instead of overwhelming with just a big binder of information. So we try to touch on little things each time, each visit. And we have them, again, fill that transition assessment out every year so we can kind of see where they're at and, you know, maybe even give them a little homework to work on till when we see them next time. Um, so 16 to 17, managing health condition independently. So let your team ask questions at the visits. Let your team watch or listen to you as you make the appointments for them so that they'll be able to do it, have them practice it. Um, let your team watch and listen to how you fill prescriptions. You can have your team fill, um, you know, then you can listen in. You know, of course, how to access emergency care. And then 17, 18, we want to make sure that um, we're promoting um, engaging in wellness behaviors. So talking with the teens about how important medicine is or just encouraging them to make good choices, which could be making sure they're getting plenty of sleep, getting um, exercise, you know, eating a nutritious diet, and um, managing their stress. You know that we know there's a lot of stress out there right now um, with school and just what's going on in the world. And then 18 to 19, getting familiar with health insurance, community resources. So talking with teens about health insurance plans and what role that plays in their health care. You know, and helping your teen to reapply for insurance if needed or get new coverage. And then you know we all want to talk with the teens about what are their plans for the future, and we talk about this pretty much every time. But just you know encouraging them to go to college, for to work, just helping them dream and and keep pursuing um, all their plans. Okay, so sibling support. Um, so you know siblings can feel isolated. Um, you know, some siblings may feel isolated when there's somebody in the family has a chronic illness. And they might have all kinds of feelings erupting, like jealousy, guilt maybe even that they didn't get MS, or resentment, or just curiosity about MS. So you really want to keep them informed and involved so that they feel like, a, you know, they are valued. They... You know, maybe they can have a particular time when they get to choose the activity y'all are going to do together. Or if they're upset and they're just not really talking, maybe they could journal and write their feelings out or draw a picture to talk to you about. And encourage them to ask questions too. And they may even want to make a list of fun things they can do together with their um, sibling and if they're doing extra chores, you know, around the house, maybe, you know, they get an, a little small reward for that, um, that extra help. And again, whatever you're feeling, it's, that's okay. 
um, in, um, family meetings. Okay, I love this. So I think it'd be great if everybody could have a standing family meeting where you give y'all give yourself an hour a week to discuss things, brainstorm about, well, some of the things you could first talk about is things that you're grateful for. That's always a great way to start things. And then maybe bring up the stressors or concerns people have. You know, everybody gets a turn. And then brainstorm about solutions and how y'all can support each other together. And again, you know, not having the TV on, not having all those distractions around, and, you know, let everybody have equal time. And, you know, of course, don't um, hesitate to reach out for professional help if, if needed, you know, to help facilitate some of these conversations. Um, and just something that I want everybody to remember is just that, you know, every family has their challenges and everything is not about MS. Um, so you want to find a place, you know, keeping the MS in its place, um, but, but also treating it and managing it. So I think we are going to do another polling question, and this is, what is your favorite activity to do with your family? And our options here are playing games, having a movie night, having dinner together, getting outside um, in nature, or not sure, we need to prioritize more time together. This is a fun question too, you know. It I guess is. going outside. Another fun <laughs> what one. What do you think your favorite is, Catherine? Well, I do. I love getting out in nature for sure, and um, yeah, I would say getting out in nature, taking walks, riding the bike. Um, right, that's like our main kind option of, now yeah. too. <laughs> it is. It is. Yes. <laughs> It looks sure like we're pretty um, evenly matched, playing games, movie okay. night, having dinner together, and getting outside. That's what everybody likes. And then some folks are still prioritizing, which it can be hard in this time, right? <laughs> it can. It can. Cause we can't do all the things we used to do. But yes, please, I encourage everybody, make a list of all the things everybody likes. You know, let one person pick. But, you know, put the phone down. Put the chores to the back. Put you know, work to the back and just everybody have something fun together, you know, taking a walk, cooking, doing arts and crafts together. You know, well, I do love game nights too. <laughs> I think doing board games can be super fun as well. Um, and then just for parents, y'all please go do date night too. Yeah, I just really want to encourage that because you deserve that and need that um, just as much as these family times. So, so yes, please don't let that go to the wayside and make that a priority to do some fun things together. So um, we, I am going to be handing over um, our presentation, but I just want to remind everybody, you know, please put some questions in the chat box. You can do it, you know, during mine, during um, Dr. Harder's, and um, so we can answer those after the presentation. But I am going to hand this over now to my wonderful colleague that we all adore, um, Dr. Harder, and she is going to continue on. Well, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I'm excited to be here today to talk about how we navigate school um, and build a community during the transition year. So um, starting with school, I wanted us to talk a little bit about um, formal support plans to help individuals with MS in the classroom settings um, to help your child get what they need. I think it's really important to emphasize that, um, I think this audience will appreciate that MS affects everyone a little bit differently. So when we think about uh, youth with MS, um, the same is true. So depending on um, you know, the symptoms and a whole host of variables, um, there can be really different needs. And so um, everything that we plan um, and the programming in schools should be really customized to the student, um, the student in the classroom and figuring out exactly what they need. 
So um, we know this can feel really overwhelming, um, especially having a, a child with a chronic condition. But the good news is that there are actually federal laws in place that protect our students with disabilities um, and allow for programming to help them um, in the school setting. So um, we're going to kind of jump into that now, talk about those details. Um, so, you know, I'll say one thing um, that, that all parents of a child with MS or a teen with MS can do is request a meeting with the school to discuss MS, but also um, what the needs are. And I would strongly recommend putting this request in writing. That actually triggers um, the start of a clock. <laughs> so a school um, has only so long to respond after a request, a formal request is put forth by a parent. So that is my piece of advice there is to put it in writing and have that documentation. And then very importantly, um, whether or not there is a formal plan in place or things are moving that direction, I think it's really critical to speak to and coordinate with the nurse at the school um, to provide that medical information and any emergency contacts. So best to be proactive um, and kind of plan ahead in case symptoms did emerge during the school day or something along those lines. And so um, these terms here could be foreign to, to folks on this, uh, this webinar here, but I'm going to tell you what these mean. Um, so 504 and IEP meeting um, would be what would be requested and scheduled to really plan and set up those accommodations. One really important point, um, even though schools have nurses and these great um, medical experts, it's important that uh, none of us assume that anybody at the school, nurses, teachers, administrators, really know and understand what MS is. And as we just pointed out earlier, even if they are aware of MS, maybe they have a friend or family member with MS, they, they don't know exactly how it impacts your child. So we really want to um, emphasize educating school personnel. I know those of us at Children's who work in the clinic do this on a regular basis and have the privilege of, uh, you know, communicating and coordinating with the schools. And I think that's a great thing. Um, so there's also um, an MSAA toolkit that can kind of help with this um, type of thing as well. So I wanted to, to be sure to mention that. So talking um, about this 504 plan. So 504 um, actually is, uh, it comes from federal law. So that's why they call it a, a 504 plan. Um, and it's designed to help students with disabilities design that customized education plan. I mentioned before, I'll emphasize it again, this is um, highly customized to the individual. It isn't just a, you know, a blanket one size fits all list of accommodations. It's really very specific to what the student needs. Um, and as we'll talk about, this may change over time. Actually, we expect it to change over time because what we need in fifth grade is going to be very different from what we need in, in you know, high school or college. So, um, so be prepared that the, the plans will change over time. Um, so the key here with a 504 plan is students can qualify if they have a condition that affects or limits their um, life activities. So learning might be um, one of those life activities, but there is a very long list of these. Um, and the condition, you know, would be multiple sclerosis, right? So that's what we're um, focusing in on. In the school setting, um, they'll refer to medical conditions um, by calling it other health impairment or OHI. So you may hear that term um, when you're interacting with the school. So that's what that refers to um, and is particularly relevant, I would say, to our students with MS. So again, our students with disabilities or with MS or an other health impairment are protected under this federal law. And then there are some um, variations in how these things, these federal laws are applied state to state. So we have things in Texas that you might not see in, in other states, but in general, states are expected to follow this federal law. It's just their execution of that um, may look different. They may have some different terms. So just be aware of that if you're ever talking to folks from um, different states. There could be some uh, nuanced differences there. Um, and I wanted to give you some examples of accommodation. So what does that mean? What does that even look like? Um, so some common ones I will say that I um, you know, recommend in our clinic would be things like extended time for exams, 
um, maybe preferential seating, we call it, um, in the front of the classroom to, to block out distractions and really help them focus on the teacher. Um, there is an accommodation that allows for adapted physical education, or PE, so that they can still participate, but then it's adapted so they can do so in a safe manner um, and accommodating for any physical needs that they may have. Um, Note-taking assistance is a big one because, um, you know, listening to a lecture and keeping up with writing notes can sometimes be really difficult, um, whether that's because of attention difficulties or maybe using our hands is harder to do quickly, and um, so it could be kind of a fine motor difficulty. There's lots of reasons we might suggest note-taking assistance. And then an elevator pass can be really useful to avoid stairs and crowded hallways when navigating um, the school environment. Um, many times our uh, patients with MS will benefit from having a restroom pass, um, a pass to go see the nurse, um, and many other things. So those are just some examples I wanted to share um, of an accommodation, but there are many, many more. And again, those would be determined based on your student's specific needs. So um, here we have this brief um, 504 plan checklist. So you really wanna start out by just making contact with the person at the school, that point person for 504. So many times that's called a 504 coordinator. The principal is a great place to start, the school counselor. Um, usually, you know, even if that, those are not the, the point people for it, they're going to know who to send you to. Um, and so there may be some paperwork they ask you to fill out, but again, you can request that meeting. And again, I'll say do that, uh, make that request in writing. Um, and then, you know, having ready some information on MS, the so kind of basics of that, and how that specifically impacts your child. That's um, a really important thing you can do to educate the school. You can also engage um, those from your treatment team if you needed um, uh, those folks to provide resources or information or communicate with the school. Um, and then coming from all of this, you should have a written plan um, that says exactly what these accommodations are. And then um, if the school should deny any services, they have to notify you in writing um, and then give you information on how to appeal. So there are several procedural safeguards in place. If you disagree with the school and the school's decision, we also always say if you see the plan and you don't agree with it, you don't have to sign off on it. You know, you can continue the conversation about it. Um, and then as we said earlier, we'll update this plan as needed um, as the child ages and the needs change and we know that they will change. So then um, if any of you have heard the term IEP and um, that stands for Individualized Education Program and this is really we're getting now into special education. 504 accommodations are separate from special education so think of special education and IEP as um, providing typically more support than a 504 and whereas 504 provides accommodations um, and they don't change the curriculum per se, the IEP and special education, um, there is the ability to modify the curriculum, say if someone is not on grade level. So there's more support and the uh, plans are much more detailed. Um, they look at performance on standardized tests, um, at um, performance on tests, quizzes, homework. They're really looking very closely here um, at educational need. Um, and so figuring out where that child is academically and um, meeting them where they are in order to support them in the school environment. Um, so this is another place where you might hear the term other health impaired or OHI, which again is um, the most relevant cate category for um, those students with multiple sclerosis or, on, or any other medical condition. So wanted to mention that. So thinking of our brief IEP checklist, um, so to start the process, a referral is made, um, and this could be to the school counselor, school psychologist, you know, any point of contact um, at the school, an administrator can typically get you started. And this can be um, initiated by a teacher, a parent, or a doctor. Um, and so information is gathered about your child's progress, their academic challenges, and then um, they look at what specific strategies may help, sometimes without doing additional assessment. 
But if they try those strategies and they're really not working out, they um, would probably move forward with additional testing. And so there um, is a um, evaluation that takes place in the school. A report is generated giving an overview of findings and also recommendations. Um, and I will mention, as a neuropsychologist, we do comprehensive evaluations focused on how MS impacts someone in terms of their learning, their memory, and academic skills, and all kinds of things, fine motor functioning. Um, those reports from a neuropsychologist or even a psychologist who does, um, say, psychoeducational evaluations, those can be um, provided to the school, and frequently, in my experience, families do provide those reports, and sometimes they'll use that evaluation without completing their own, um, you know, formal testing, but sometimes they still do the, the formal testing. So, um, at the very least, it can uh, be a, a supplement to what the school is uh, performing in their evaluation process. As we said with 504, these individualized um, programs um, can and should change to address the needs of a child over time. Um, again, we expect that to happen because as we age and grow and the demands increase in our school environment, um, the things that we need, the support that we need will also change. So looking at a case study here, um, so this is about Jill. Um, and so the, the parent is asking, Jill, do you feel comfortable talking to your teachers if you're not feeling well? And Jill is saying, yes, Ms. Smith and the nurse are very supportive. Um, which is fantastic to have supportive um, folks in the school environment that a student could go to. We really want for students to identify those people that they can access during a school day if they are struggling. And then if something happens relative to MS, so here um, the parent is saying, with your recent flare-up, I think it's important that I call the school for a meeting. I want to make sure everything is in place with your plan. So great example of how um, parent and student can initiate with the school to give them updates. We know that things can change with MS and they do change. That's the nature of MS. And so making sure that the school is aware um, as those changes happen. And parent saying, I'm proud of you. And the, the student saying, well, if, if we have to, we'll call the doctor's office for any notes about changes in my condition. What I really like about this, and Catherine spoke about it, is, is really putting that the teen in the driver's seat. You know, they, the teen can call, can get the information they need and start to take charge um, of their um, both medical care and educational needs. And I, I think um, this is a great example of that here. So now we have another polling question. So the accommodations I can advocate for for my child under a 504 plan and an IEP may include, we'll see what everyone says here. So a second set of books for home, recorded lessons, elevator access, gym modifications, breaks in the nurse's office, oral exams, bathroom pass, or all of the above. We've got we've got all of the above. I think that we're tracking with you. <laughs> we have gym modifications. It's a suggestion, yeah, all of the above. Uh -huh. And gym yeah. modifications. Mm -hmm. Yes. And gym modifications is absolutely correct, and so is all of the above, right? Because <laughs> any of these um, and many more uh, could be accommodations that someone might advocate for. Um, so awesome. Very good. All right. Well, thinking about one of my favorite topics, which is transition um, to adulthood, I want to spend a little time here thinking about um, the transition to independence. And you know, we're working on this long before um, we move out of, of the house or uh, go to college or start, you know, start a new job or something along those lines. At the same time, I think on, on the medical side and even the school side, it can feel like the change happens overnight. All of a sudden, um, care providers at a hospital, um, people in the schools, they really want to talk to um, the person, the student, um, the, the young, young person with MS. So uh, once they turn 18, and, and a lot of that is because of really the law. Um, so it's important that when um, a child becomes a young adult at 18, um, that they're really 
prepared um, and ready to take on the role and responsibility and also um, being able to talk to their medical providers, um, people in the school about what they need. And that sounds kind of daunting and scary, um, but if we plan ahead and start preparing well before age 18, um, it doesn't feel um, as anxiety provoking. And I know Catherine spent some time talking about that um, in our transition program at Children's. Um, so, and this may look different for every family. I should also emphasize that it, it might look different for every team because not all teams have the same um, skills or strengths, right, and weaknesses. So really wanna think about the individual and make sure anything we're asking them to do is within um, what they can achieve. Um, so we don't wanna make this um, overly frustrating for everyone involved. So um, things to consider, ways to increase that independence. Um, things like household chores, um, treatment adherence, so taking charge of, of their treatment, um, if that's taking medication each day or setting up appointments to, for that. Um, thinking about disclosure um, to others, and uh, I think we've emphasized um, in our previous presentation, you know, this is a personal choice. Um, no one has to share um, that they have MS, um, but thinking carefully about uh, what that might look like, the words that might be used, and um, who they might decide to share that information with. And I think um, also time management is a big one, a big opportunity for teens to start to um, manage time and priorities um, in their kind of daily uh, responsibilities and daily to-do list. So um, things that you and your team might consider. So what's next, um, right? What is after high school? We start talking to our uh, patients about this really early on um, in the high school years. So this might look like college, it might look like getting a job or getting some vocational training. Uh, there are many, many different pathways after high school. Um, will MS impact that decision? And what concerns uh, do you have about this transition? Um, also, what is exciting? Um, and I know even exciting things can represent a stressor, but uh, we always wanna uh, keep that in focus of what um, we're looking forward to um, and what is exciting to us as we um, take the next step. And so here's an example um, of, of kind of listing some goals. So this is um, Dominique. Um, and so a goal is for Dominique to make her own doctor's appointment. And so, um, you know, we have a, a date that we want to achieve this that can be listed um, to kind of help us track this and then think of a reward. How are we going to celebrate when this happens? Because these are big things to celebrate as we um, let our team sort of take the reins and, and really um, lead uh, their health care. So that's, that's a great example. Uh, we love to see our teams start making their own appointments. I love it when they call me to make an appointment. Um, so then uh, Dominique researches four colleges she wants to apply to, and that, you know, in this case needs to happen around December. And then a reward is, hey, we're gonna visit those colleges. You'll get to see these places you've been reading about and researching. And then um, another important one, talking to the Disability Service Office about campus and um, campus resources, paperwork deadlines. Uh, similarly, this will happen in December, according to this timeline. And then those college visits are, um, once again, the reward. So getting to see uh, what Dominique has researched. So some things about college tips. I think this is really, really important to contact the Disability Services Office. Um, I think it's important to do as you're considering schools, but it's especially important once you decide on the school. And it may seem like it's too early if it's before school has started, but it really isn't. Waiting until classes begin is actually kind of too late. <laughs> not, it's not too late, I mean, you can still do it, but you want your accommodations in place from the time you begin your classes. So, um, you know, if you don't do it, you can still get that done, but you may not have accommodations for say the first exams or the first um, lectures or classroom sessions. So we really um, encourage our college students to contact uh, that office uh, quickly and get accommodations in place. Another one is um, making an emergency plan. So um, whether you're kind of local or away from home, just knowing where the campus health center is, um, 
you know, where's the closest hospital? Do I need to establish care with a neurologist that's closer to the college or university? Just having that plan in place. Um, and also thinking about the campus and how am I going to navigate around the, the campus? Are there lots of hills? What about elevators? Um, will it be easy to get from class to class? And related to that would be um, planning a schedule that gives you plenty of time to go between your classes or maybe take a rest between classes if that's needed. Um, also thinking about the best time of day that you function and putting um, classes that are really require a lot of concentration at those that time of the day. And then um, in terms of kind of disclosure to roommates and friends, you know, thinking about that carefully again, how you might want to talk about that. Um, could they be part of your emergency plan if you did share that? Um, and then, you know, just in general, um, are you comfortable and kind of what words would you use? Um, in a moment, we'll talk about that and give some examples. Um, as we've said before, it's really up to the team who they tell. So talking about the pros and cons um, and listing people in their lives they may want to tell, um, I think is really a, a good place to start. So here's an example. Um, imagine um, Dominique is in college and she just told her new roommate about living with MS. So the roommate says, is it possible for me to get MS because we are living together? And Dominique provides some education. No, it is not contagious. Um, no need to be concerned, but thanks for asking. So it ends kind of on a, hey, thanks for your curiosity, uh, but no, I'm not contagious. Um, and then the roommate may continue or have more questions or have more curiosity. What medications do you take? Do you have to go to the doctor a lot? And here Dominique can set some boundaries and say, you know, I'd rather not talk about the details right now. Um, you're the first person I've told here at school, but I'll, I'll share more once I'm ready. So it's just a nice respectful way to kind of set a boundary and say, hey, you know, um, I've given you some information. I'll tell you more when, when I'm ready. And I, I really like that example there. So um, here in closing, just want to um, give some additional resources um, from MSAA, um, National MS Society, and then um, our GOT Transition website here. All of those have great resources. And I'm going to give it back to Alexis to, to um, do some question and answer. Wow, Dr. Harder, Catherine, thank you so much. That was truly fantastic. And we're so appreciative to have you this afternoon and for taking a deeper dive into, you know, these topics with us. I felt like I was in a room with you. Um, as mentioned before the program, I please encourage everyone and thank everyone here today for taking the time to complete the like program evaluation survey. Um, and if you have additional questions or you'd like to know more about MSA's programs and services, please don't hesitate to reach out um, directly to me, Alexis Crispino, but um, Dr. Harder and Catherine, if you don't mind, we have a few questions too. So sure. I have, um, yeah, the first mm -hmm. question I have for Catherine, my daughter has early onset MS. My son feels like my daughter gets more attention. How can I help my son feel like he's getting as much attention as my daughter or help balance that? Hmm. So this is an idea that um, not from from something else, but I just love this idea of maybe having a date night that is just with the other sibling. So, you know, mom and um, son or dad and son, like that them have just an activity that just the two of them go do um, so that they can have, you know, the undivided attention at that time. And, um, but again, you know, praising them for, you know, any help that they're doing with, you know, helping the other, um, the sibling. And, you know, again, encouraging them to do fun things together that's just them two. Um, yeah. Because I know it can idea. take a lot. Yeah, it can take a lot from the siblings. Um, or even if you can't, you know, get out, you know, let's go take a walk together. Or let's, you know, just maybe letting them have some one-on-one -on -one time with you too. Yeah. Thank you. That is such a great idea. Um, let's see. So I have another question for Catherine and Dr. Harder. So I know it's important to have a supportive school to help navigate my child's 504 plan, but how would you suggest I approach communicating with my child's school if they haven't been that supportive of the needs of my child's condition? MS isn't easy for the school to understand and how it impacts my child's day-to-day -day needs. 
Yeah, that's mm-hmm. a great question, and um, mm-hmm. and completely it does come up. <laughs> It yeah. does. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And thinking about schools um, struggling to understand them us, and not only that, I just will point out, you know, day to day can look different in the same person. So some, and and I will write this in my reports. You know, don't assume because you know, I'm gonna make up a name here. Johnny could do this on this day that he can do it tomorrow or the next day, right? So it's it's uh, kind of hard, I think, for Um, people to understand and and something our neurologist said in our clinic yesterday was um, our kids with MS, uh, you know, it's it's an invisible disability, quote unquote, um, in many cases, in many cases, you just wouldn't know if you are interacting with them. So um, I think that makes it even harder. Um, You know, in a situation where um, a school may not seem as supportive or is having some trouble in the understanding, a couple things come to mind, and we'll see if Catherine has others. Um, one would be, um, you know, engaging the um, the team medical providers to see if uh, there can be some communication between, say, the hospital and the school, um, which which I know we do a lot, and it seems to go a long way. Um, parents are amazing advocates, and sometimes having an additional layer of ad- advocacy from providers can be um, really, really powerful. The other thing is I would just try to put as much in writing as you can um, just to keep that paper trail, the documentation. And then if you're feeling like, you know, the school's really not following the plan we put together, um, if it's a 504 plan, um, parents have the, you know, ability to go to the Office for Civil Rights um, to, you know, report this and, and get some intervention. And that would be in a more extreme case, of course, but uh, I do like for parents to know kind of um, what all those different steps are to escalate it if they are having concerns. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. Did you yeah, uh, did you have great. any other thoughts? Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and this is we are so lucky at Children's that we have a school liaison. So yeah. she will, you know, helps us so much in communicating with the schools and even came up with guides. Um, but parents could come up with guides too just on what MS is, here are some of the symptoms, because again, a lot of those are invisible symptoms, and you know, people with MS have good and bad days. Um, and then just here's possible accommodations that could be helpful um, to give them ideas, because maybe they just don't know what to do, because <laughs> they haven't had somebody um, in their school with MS before. So um, you know, maybe just, you know, parents are just putting something together um, you know, like that, that can be used. Um, and again, we're just really lucky to have a school liaison that will contact the schools, but it could be anybody on the medical team, again, like Dr. Harder was saying, to contact them and give them more information and ideas. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And just as a friendly note for our participants, if you all have any questions, you can pop them into the chat box still. Um, I do have some more questions. I really like this next one. Um, I think it's great because lots of folks will be seeing or maybe being around family with the um, holidays coming up. And so this question is for both uh, Dr. Harder and Catherine. So thank you for suggesting using I statements versus you statements. Are there any times that I should avoid using I statements when talking about my MS diagnosis with my family and thinking especially about discussions with a broader range of people? age range of people. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I just, I don't know that you can really go wrong with I statements because you're basically just expressing your feelings, Mm -hmm. you know, and whatever you feel, you know, is what you feel. And, you know, you have a right to feel your feelings. So, you know, I don't know that, um, I mean, and the I statements is just to try your best to communicate so that the other person understands but doesn't feel defensive so that like it's you know not their problem that you know that you're feeling that way it's just how you feel you know it's an observation um you know with the facts absolutely thank you so much and i guess i think we have time if it's okay we'll do one more question um 
this is an interesting one, too, I think. So my teenager has disclosed their MS with some of their friends. Some have been supportive, but others don't understand. How can I support my child's desire to disclose their diagnosis while protecting them from the situations that might arise from doing so? That's a, a great question, and um, mm-hmm. maybe I'll kick off with a few thoughts and see, Catherine, what you think. Um, you know, I think this is a, a great example. I think, uh, you know, parents are always looking for teaching opportunities in life, and so um, maybe helping to um, talk to them about that, you know, different people may have different responses to things and reminding um, their team that, um, about what they can control, what they can manage um, themselves, but that, you know, we can't control other people and their reactions and, and what they say and do. Um, just and, and then providing um, reassurance. And um, I think also role playing uh, prior to these conversations can be really beneficial because I think um, kind of having prepared, you know, what you're going to say, how you're going to describe things. We, we said before in the last presentation, MS is really complicated and can be difficult uh, for professionals to describe to each other. So even more so for teens. Um, so those are just some thoughts that kind of come to mind. Um, Catherine, I don't know if you have other suggestions. think that that's, you know, it's really great. And I think it's so helpful. And Catherine, if you don't have any, um, if you have any additional comments, that'd be great. And if not, I think that we're about ready to um, wrap up and conclude for our afternoon. Um, Catherine, did you have any other additional notes you wanted to mention? All right. <laughs> thank you. So thank you again so much, Dr. Harder and Catherine and our friends over at Impact that helped us um, host this program today. And as a friendly note, this afternoon's webinar will be archived to our website so you can revisit this information or share it with any friends or family in your community who you might be in, who you think might be interested. I'd again like to thank our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Novartis for making this webinar possible. Uh, as well as if you can um, complete our educational program survey, it would be greatly appreciated. And we hope that everybody has a wonderful rest of your day. And we're so pleased to have the chance to connect with you again. And until next time, thank you so much, everybody. That concludes today's presentation. Thank you for joining us. Please follow the link in the prompt to be redirected to the participation evaluation form.